17th September 2023, The Perils of the Farmer by Pastor Simon James. Greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome to Riverside Tabernacle. I'm Pastor Simon and it's my honor to share God's word with you. We trust you will find this message inspiring and uplifting. May you be receptive to the voice of the blessed Holy Spirit. The perils of, of the farmer. The perils of the farmer. This message is primarily aimed at those who have a desire to preach the word of God, to evangelize or to be intercessors. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for this thy word. We believe, O oh Lord, that this message is for your children today. And Lord, I thank you that you are using us this morning. We pray for an anointing to be over us and extend, O oh Lord, into every home and every vehicle, every place where your children are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our reading is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 14, verses 28 to 29. And when much people were gathered together, uh, so, sorry, it's Luke 13, 4. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and he was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And others fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit in a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath years to hear, let him hear. Farming is not easy. Early one day before sunrise, a farmer went out to his field. He stood on the narrow path, snaking through his field, and looked at the stubborn rock he had failed to remove over the years of sweaty toil. He thought of how the weeds grew faster than the wheat, and caused the wheat to be stunted. He hefted the big bag of seeds in his hands, and wondered how much of his precious seed would, go, would grow to harvest, and how much would be lost. Farming was tough. But the harvest was worth it. Farming is tough, but the harvest is still worth it. It was getting light now, and he thought he had better start before the birds came. The birds ate the seeds before they sprouted, and the ripe wheat too. He began scattering the seed. The breeze was light, so most of the seed would fall in the freshly turned up soil. But even the light breeze was strong enough to drop some of the seeds outside the prepared ground. And some fell on the pathway, some fell on the rock. There was not much he could do about, about it, so he steadily went on sowing. Some of the seed fell on the pathway on which he walked. The soil was hard and those seeds would be snatched up by the birds or trodden by whoever walked through that place. He passed the rock in his field and tried to avoid dropping seeds onto the rock. Still a few fell on it, and those would be lost too. Wheat does not grow on rocks. Most of his seed fell in the fertile, freshly prepared soil, but they faced stiff competition from the weeds and the thorns that thrived in good ground. Weeds were hardy and grew much faster, often choking out the wheat in the race for water and sunlight and nutrients. The wheat could be stunted as a result. He would work hard to scare the birds away, until the crops took root. And then again, when the harvest was ready, he had to scare the birds away again. The seeds on the rock would sprout and grow for a while with much promise. Then because of the shallow depth of soil, they would starve of water and minerals, and the sun would wither them away quickly. Farming is definitely not for the faint-hearted, he thought. I want to speak to you about birds, rocks, and thorns this morning. Jesus explained the preaching of God's word with a parable. 
Jesus used this parable of the sower sowing his seed to explain what happens when we preach the word. And as I told you at the beginning, this word is aimed at those personal evangelists, evangelists, preachers, pastors, whoever you are that takes the word of God to people. There are certain perils that you will face and you need to understand those perils and also learn how to work through them. The seed is God's word. Jesus explained this parable. The seed is God's word and the sower is the evangelist of various kinds. The various areas where the seed falls are the different types of people which we call ground. We hear the word and their responses. So let's unpack this parable together. The birds along the path represent those who oppose the word. Their aim is to prevent the word from being preached. Their aim is the same as Satan's aim to prevent you and prevent others from entering heaven or the new world that God creates. They, the devil wants to take as many with him to hell as possible. Societal norms have changed to a point where the Bible is rejected and its values are rejected in favor of the self and self, self-ego, self-gratification, pleasures. Man is presented as a God and has no need for a distant angry God who punishes sinners. That's the rhetoric you hear all the time. The rocks are those who receive the word enthusiastically, but are dissuaded by arguments of science, logic and lies. Societal norms and secular education question biblical testimony and offer secu secular explanations for the supernatural. They deny the God of the Bible or argue for other deities. And the main point that is missing for those that are rocks will receive the word enthusiastically and then lose out and, and then fall away is because they are not nourished properly by the word of God. The farmer has forgotten his seed. The seed, the seed among the rocky ground grows for a while, but when times of testing comes, they fall away. Such believers, believers usually accept Jesus for selfish reasons and have no real commitment to Jesus, but want what they could get from him. The classic one is they want the healing, not the healer. When persecution, testing or temptation present, they revert to their former lifestyles and forget their commitment to Jesus. The thorny ground where the weeds are, are those who receive the message sincerely and are committed to Jesus when the going is good. When life goes south, they turn sour. Their faith is not strong enough to overcome the trials of life. At this point, they give up or blame God. Their faith is not built on solid ground. And this is important for the farmer to know. Because many people come to the Lord, to the Lord Jesus, expecting that life will be plain sailing. But there's no way in the Bible that the Lord has promised that life will be plain sailing, though some evangelists promise that. And when I use the word evangelist, I'm encompassing everyone who preaches, even the ones who testify. Now these people who tell others that come to Jesus and all will be well are misrepresenting Jesus and his word. Jesus didn't say that all will be well. What he said was, I will be with you always. I will help you always. There is always a time when the Lord wants to help you. And that is always Jesus wants to be with you. He wants to help you, but he's not promising you that you will not face problems. You will face the birds of the air. 
that seek to snatch the word of God from you so that you do not, it does not grow and bring forth fruit. You will be met with secular arguments about the existence of God. Especially when you become a Christian, you present yourself or you place yourself in harm's way. I need to warn you that about that. And that is something you must tell your people because the moment you become a Christian, the devil takes an interest in you. Before that, he has no problem with you. He has no truck with you. He doesn't care about you because you belong to him anyway. But the moment you turn and you say, I will su support Jesus. I will follow Jesus. I give my heart to Jesus. Here comes Satan. Because he wants to stop you from progressing in the kingdom of God. He will send his birds. You will meet arguments. You will meet discussions. You will meet uh, on social media. You will, you will see videos and discussions but about how there can't be a God. And society nowadays has changed. Whereas in the 50s and the 60s and even the 70s, God was always upmost or topmost in lives of people. We used to see it in school when we used to pray before we entered our classrooms. We had an assembly and we prayed and then slowly societal norms took over. Modern thinking, secular education took over to the point where it is rare to see the Lord's Prayer being, being said or recited at schools. It is rare to see families assembling every night to pray together. It is even rare to see families being churchgoers. What is disconcerting when you walk around down the street, especially in the more westernized first world countries, and you talk to people about the Lord and immediately they tell you they don't believe. They don't believe in Jesus. You see, these are the birds that Satan has sent to snatch the word. And then when it comes to the rocky, rocky ground, these are people who love the Lord, who, who want the Lord. But they haven't really thought through their commitment. You see, they really don't want the Lord. They want what he can give them. And once they have it, they will follow Christianity. They will go to church. They will attend services. They will do whatever is right. But the moment there's pressure put on them, either from the trials of life or from family and friends, they will hesitate. Some of them will not even publicly declare that they have, have chosen to serve the Lord. They will pretend that they are still part of the crowd they ran with before. Now this is what the farmer needs to understand. Because if the farmer, the, the evangelist understands that, then you, the evangelist, you the personal evangelist or whatever you are, would be able to ensure that the commitment they give has been an informed commitment. They know that this is what this ha happens and that they should make sure that they are accepting Jesus for Jesus alone and not for what he can give them. Because many times people make a very, very cursory commitment to God because they want something. But I want to tell you something. The reason we come to Jesus is not because he can give us healing. We do, but it's not the ultimate reason. It's not because he can take us out of a financial difficulty. It is because he gives us salvation, which is an antidote for sin, which is the cure for death, which is a place with the Lord forever. Now, the thorny ground people receive and they let it go. You see, when you preach the word of God, you will encounter these. You'll encounter these by and large, sometimes more of rocks and less of weeds. 
and a sprinkling of birds and some. But whatever you do, you'll find a mix of all this. And the birds don't just stop. There are birds which go and pick up the, the fresh seeds as they fall on the path. There are the birds which dig in the freshly covered sea, uh, soil to pick up the seeds and eat them. Then there are birds which will destroy your crops or steal your crops just when they are ready to be harvested. So what am I saying? You can lose, or the people that you, you, you speak to can lose their salvation immediately. They will just not accept. Or they will receive the word and then a few days later, or a few months later, whatever, but early in the early in the Christianity, somehow something will, will dissuade them from continuing and growing. And then some of them will grow and just at harvest, they can lose their salvation just before they die, for example. And then you have the thorny ground. And I've explained that in detail. You have the weeds. And the weeds could be anything that tries to, to break your Christian spirit. Now, most of the seed of the farmer fell on fertile ground where he was sure that it would grow. Now, these are the people that are sincerely seeking the true God. They sincerely commit to the Lord. But even though the farmer knows or thinks, sorry, even though the farmer thinks or has this warm feeling that most of his seed fell on fertile ground and it will be sure to grow, he can never be 100% certain. Because even where the seed is growing, there are perils for the farmer and for his harvest. Now the people on fertile ground are those who have experienced a spiritual famine in their lives or spiritual drought and have accepted the invitation of Jesus Christ to fill that void that is in their life. We all have a void in our life until we meet Jesus. Now life as a Christian, especially in the initial stages, may look very rosy. But you will face adversity. The first petal of the sown seeds is the birds. Evil agents of natural and supernatural origin try to snatch the word away before it takes root. If you want to destroy a country, if you want to destroy a society, you start with the children. If you want to build a society, you start with the children. That is why education has gone the way it's gone, because Satan and his cronies, his human agencies are working against what was once Christian values. Now children as young as two and three are being told about transgenderism, about other sexual uh, uh, sort of uh, norms, which are not norms. I, I, I watched an article recently where a mother claims that her child, when, he, when she was two, decided that she wanted to be a boy. How can a two-year-old decide that? But you see, th these are the agencies of Satan. These are designed to snatch the word before it takes root, to harden the ground, to keep walking over that ground so it's hard and it will not accept the word of God. These unchristian agencies argue for the status quo. They want things to remain as they are or to retrogress. The supernatural agent that controls his argument is Satan himself. And he also tries to influence your thoughts. And I'm talking about the thoughts of those who are receiving the word. And he can, he can influence them in such a way that they do not accept immediately. They just shut the ears to the word of God. And that is, what, that is because for years he has changed their frame, frame of reference. The way they look at life. The way they look at things. To reject anything they cannot see.
to reject any mention of a superior being that lives outside our times and space and is not made of the matter that we are made. They reject a creator for a nefarious, incoherent and uncertain explosion that happened when nothing exploded, yet so much became. But man has been, uh, has been nurtured, has been sensitized to believe that we all came from nothing. When the Bible is so, so, so clear, in the beginning, God created. Now, so how does Satan influence your thoughts? Because many people say Satan cannot influence your thoughts. How can he influence your thoughts? I'll tell you how he is. For those who belong to him, he inhabits them. That's a fact. Okay. It might not be all out possession, where in, in other words, where a demon inhabits a body, but it is possession in the sense that he owns them. He also uses his children, those same children, to influence the Christian's mindset. Remember Eve's encounter with the snake? You think the snake got up one day and went to Eve and said, eat that fruit? No. It was a process with, in which Satan took over the snake. Satan took over that serpent. And he slowly won its confidence until the snake and Satan were synonymously embodied together. They were one body. They became one body and one mind. Yet it was Satan's spirit and the snake's spirit, if you want to call it that. But they became one body. They became one. And when the snake spoke, he spoke for Satan. And when Satan spoke, he used the body of the snake. And used, he used innuendo, subtle questioning, to redirect Eve's thoughts towards doubting God. Doubting her husband, firstly, what he said, whether his message was, was accurate, and then causing her to doubt God. And, and causing her to think that maybe God was being selfish and God just didn't want them to enjoy what was rightfully theirs. And then they wanted it. They wanted it. And once the, the mind starts to desire something, the body will follow. The body will obey. And he used subtle questioning innuendo suggestions to cause her to disobey God. And that's what he did in her mind. He messed with her mind. Eve did not even see Satan coming. She did not see Satan coming. That is why she said the serpent deceived me. But God knew it wasn't the, just the snake. He punished the snake for allowing himself to be used by the devil. But he punished the devil by saying... My son, the seed of a woman, will crush your head. You see, Eve thought she was having a conversation with a friend. It was a friendly snake. The snake might have been alluring. It might have been some being, a, a creature that, that Eve grew fond of. And once the devil's people gain your confidence in them, gain your attention, gain your friendship, you are on your way to losing your salvation or becoming hard ground. Even if you were fertile ground, you can change. Farmers, take note of that. It sounds like I'm speaking to the ground, but I'm speaking to you as well, farmers. That is why these are one of the things that when your child one is, is approaching marriageable age, you find they start to... some. Knight in shining armor comes before them, but he serves another king. 
and he tends to sweep your daughter off her feet, let her out of her, her tower in which she feels entrapped, inverted commas. Or your son meets this princess that loves him so much that he's fairest in all the land, the Snow White. And once they married, when the Lord calls them into his ministry, then they find that there's a dragon that they married. Or a tiger with, with claws. The cat has become a tiger. The knight in shiny armor is now breathing out fire like a dragon. And they lose their fertility. They lose their salvation. It's all about winning your confidence. Now the weeds and thorns are the second peril that coexists with the seed in the fertile field. Where does the weeds grow best? They grow best in fertile, in fertile soil. Yes, weeds can grow on rocks and they can grow on trees. They grow anywhere. They don't need much, but they grow best in the fertile fields together with the seed that you planted. Now both enjoy fertile soil. However, there's a subtle, there's a, not a subtle, but there's a great chair difference between the wheat and the weeds. Or the wheat's aims and the weed's aims. The wheat's aim is simply to grow and produce a crop for the use of the farmer and his family. But the weed's aim is to grow and reproduce after its kind. That's the first aim. The second aim is to outgrow the wheat. In fact, its second aim is to outgrow and choke out the wheat. So it destroys the wheat. Weeds are useless plants, but they are hardy. They are tough as nails. And they have a voracious appetite for water, sunlight and nutrients. And they can grow anywhere. If they get water, they will drink it all up to the detriment of every other plant around it. If they don't get water, they can conserve themselves and live, outlive the wheat. The wheat will die in the rocks, but the weeds won't. So where do weeds come from if the farmer does not consciously sow them? He doesn't sow them. Which farmer will pick up blackjack and throw in a wheat field? No, he'll never do that. He will burn the, weed, the weeds. Firstly, the weeds are hardy. So they often survive even in the soil that has been plowed and plowed and plowed and fertilized. Secondly, Jesus gives us the perfect answer. In Matthew 13, 28, he says, it is the enemy, Satan, who has done this. You remember, the laborers came to the master and said, Master, we went to the, to the farm we, to pick up the wheat, I mean, to look at the wheat, but there amongst the wheat are weeds. Who did this? And Jesus said, an enemy did this. He sows, the enemy sows anything that is used to destroy growing Christians. This can happen at any stage of life, even when the crop is ready to harvest. So the farmer must take care of the seed. Farmers, when you plant the seed, your job is not done. You need to water. You need to feed. You need to take care of the resultant plants. And even before you plant the seed, you need to prepare the soil by asking the Holy Spirit to prepare the ground, prepare the person. Before you approach somebody to give them the word of God, it is best. Okay, it doesn't work in all. It's, it's not convenient in all occasions. You don't have the, the luxury of praying for a person if you just meet them in the street. But pray that God will prepare you as the farmer as evangelists and God will prepare whatever ground he's going to send you to so that when you sow the seed it will fall on fertile ground and after sowing the seed you cannot just walk away you have to weed the field you have to remove the weeds you have to feed the plant the plants with the right fertilizer you got to water them you're going to ensure they are protected from insects, from birds, from animals. 
until the harvest is ready. And at the harvest, you have to reap it before the, way, the wind carries your wheat away. Or the rain causes your wheat to rot. Or the sun dries it up. The perils of a farmer are real. Be a farmer who is a diligent farmer. My last word. Before you evangelize, remember this. Not all of the seed, not all of your preaching will fall on good ground on listening ears. Many times your preaching will fall on deaf ears. Many times your preaching will meet with hostility and argument. And sometimes in extreme cases, persecution and violence. Other times you will be disappointed because the converts, the people that you, you brought to the Lord, do not last. They fall away when faced with trials. Sometimes you'll find that just before somebody passes on, they fell away from the faith. But be sure, though, that with proper care and attention and understanding all this, you will be a good farmer and much of your seed will grow and produce a harvest. Some 34, some 60, and some 100 fold. May God have his, add his blessings to this word. We trust you've enjoyed God's word and that it has been a blessing to you. If you're inspired by it, please share it with your friends and family. Remember, we live on Facebook every Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. This is Pastor Simon, and as always, it has been my pleasure. Till next time, God bless.